So the most important part is visible. Right, so uh, this talk is about derived Mackay correspondence. And, well, derived categories have this unfortunate reputation for being brought in without any regard for necessity of doing so. So let me first kind of try to justify why, kind of, what are the, what are the derived categories doing here. So. So, in the beginning, we had a finite subgroup of SL2C. We had a singular quotient space where we quotient out C2 by the action of the group. So we have C2 with G optimized. And we have the quotient space. And then we have y, which is because we are in surface case, the minimal resolution. We need choose one. So John Mackay observed in 1980. There was a following bijection between two sets. One set is the one which I'll call x, y, which is the set of irreducible exceptional divisors on y. This was in one-to-one -one correspondence with a set which I will denote by era g minus rho zero, and that's just non-trivial irreducible representations of g. So rho zero is my addition to trivial representation. In fact, he observed a bit more than that. I mean, it's a long story what, he, what did he actually observe. But it's not just two sets which are in correspondence. The, we have a bit uh, of structure on the sets which also coincides. So here we have intersection graph, where, which is graph whose vertices are elements of this set. And two vertices are joined by an edge if the corresponding P ones intersect. And here we have a representation graph, which is, well, definition is technical. The vertices are uh, ir irreducible representations. And the way they're joined by edges corresponds to just sort of which representations are contained in, in tensor products of which representations. But this is sort of reduced from something that these days is known as Mankai quiver. You sort of forget about the orientation of some arrows. So, and what, what coincides actually is not just these two sets, but two graphs, which sort of suggests that there's something goes on uh, between the geometry on Y and representation theory of uh, G, which is all that happens here. <coughs> so this is, this observation can know sort of classical Mackay correspondence. Sorry, but I mean, this is a given clear representation. You just say if one occurs in the tensor product of the two others. The the whole point of the of the game is that we uh, we uh, sort of state so this is pure a relation. So how does it give uh, what is from vertex row i to vertex row j? They go precisely home. Well, dim home g row i. Okay. Rho J is our okay, the invariance in, in the in the tensor problem. Okay. Yeah. Yes. 
So how many copies of row i contained in row j times the given representation theta? So, I mean, but this was nothing more than a sort of a, that uh, if you check all the, your AD cases, you will have this coincidence. Uh, the idea was to sort of come up with some natural construction and explain to see sort of how far can you, how much more structure can you put on these things and still have them coincide. So this was done by Gonzalez, Springberg, and Verdi. So Gonzalez, Springberg. Which are forever abbreviated as GSPV in about 83. The paper whose title is in French, and I will not even try to pronounce it, but what it means is geometric construction of Mokai correspondence. And what they say is the following. So let's have, with the same setting as above, take Z to be fiber product of the minimal resolution with the original vector space over the singularity. And you, we take it reduced. So this defines us actually a kind of a class. The structure shape of this thing defines us. I mean, this thing lives inside a, pro, a product of Y and C2. Anything that lives on the product of two varieties should define a correspondence between two varieties. So uh, Gonzalez, Spermik, and Verdi did this by K theory. So they considered the structure shape of this guy as something in the equivariant growth and ring of Y cross C2. So G acts on C2 naturally, G acts on Y trivially. And then we take the standard growth and ring of coherent sheaves, all coherent sheaves factor out by exact sequences. So this defines us a transform the speed of Z, which goes from KG of C2, which is equivalent growth and decrease of C2. And this goes to KY, which is just the normal ordinary growth and decrease of Y. So this is sort of your whole geometry of G. This is your whole kind of coherent sheaves and how they interact. And this is, to be quite honest, the first thing they proved that this is just representation ring of the group. So this is kind of pure representation theory to geometry. And the thing is that this guy, defined by this object, is an isomorphism of abelian groups. So it sort of doesn't respect ring structure, but it's one to one. And moreover, if you take any non-trivial representation, and if, and if you compute where does this guy take the class of, you take the uh, structure shift of the origin in C2, and you hang a representation row above it. So it's like a skyscraper shift, only have a whole representation hanging above zero. And the thing that this guy gives you immediately structure shift of some divisor twisted by minus one, in growth ring of k1, where rho is um, where e rho is something in one of the exceptional divisors on y. And in fact, if we make a map rho to e rho, because you know if 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 we if we get mapped to a class of something supported on a divisor, we can pretty much detect that. This induces uh, a bijective um, Yes, this induces precisely the bijective one-to-one -one correspondence between these two sets. So this is kind of precisely what I, what I was talking about. We have some, we, we have a correspondence of the representation theory of G and the geometry of Y, which, if you evaluate it on the representations, will give you precisely uh, the divisors. So that was kind of a very nice stuff. And this is sort of key theoretic correspondence. However, kind of, you know, when you say key theory, people say, well, when you, say, when you talk about any isomorphism of key theory, some people say, well, does this lead to the rough categories? So, through the conjecture by Reed, 
in 96 that this story should live. to higher dimensions, so three folds in particular, and to derive that exists. So this is a so-called chemosecular paper. So, I mean, I could spend the whole talk happily just talking about all sorts of exciting stuff that went on to prove this on the level of cohomology. But to sort of cut the long story short, the next major step in this business was as follows. doing threefold case. This would suggest we should have a four-name paper doing four-dimensional case around about now, but it hasn't quite materialized yet. <laughs> so they say the following. I mean, they first say, well, you know, in threefolds we don't have minimal resolutions. So the first question is sort of what, what to play this game with. Uh, so they say that we have G any subgroup of SLMC. I mean, the result is slightly more general. If I'll have time in the end, you'll hear just exactly how more general. But let's just say for the moment, for the kind of the, it's the real beauty of the result is in dimensions two and three. The new story was dimension three. So let Y be G hilt of C3. So I'll say what it is. It's a, it's a fine moduli space. Yeah. Ah, sorry, yes. Thank you. Fine moduli space of G clusters. Now, part of this story that I'm skipping there was people coming to slowly realize that uh, there was this Nakamura's G. Hilbert scheme, which was a very good candidate for a resolution. So, you know, if you take a moduli space course one of set theoretic orbits of G and C, you'll get precisely the singularity. You know, it's kind of logical that if you somehow refine these objects that you are taking, I mean, taking set theoretic orbits is pretty crude. If you, if you find a good scheme theoretic refinement, you should get a resolution. And in fact, uh, the sort of G cluster is precisely a finite length subscheme of CN whose uh, global sections give representation theory of G. So it is exactly of the same length, the same dimension. It's a little zero-dimensional subscheme as the regular representation, and it has right representation structure. So, and then, you know, the advantage of this moduli approach that we immediately know, you know, what this somewhat unnatural guy here should be. You know, this is just, you know, you know if we have Y, which is a moduli space of something in CN, then our first candidate for, for a guy on the fiber product is the universal family. So that's Z in Y cross CN, B universal family. And Can you fix the degree of these clusters? Uh, yes. The, well, the, by saying that their, that their global sections are regular representation of G, the length is precisely the number of elements ah, okay. in the group. I didn't so, hear yeah. that. Sorry, thank you. Sorry, sir. Right. Yeah, that page zero. So then, the structure shift of this guy now, not just class in the grain, but on the nose in the direct category, defines, I mean, for a Mukai transform, it's just the same word for taking, you know, if you have an object in diagonal, you can do correspondence. Now, for a reason which will also hopefully have the time to speak about, this one goes backwards. That one goes from C2 to Y. 
This one goes from y, your category of y, to equivariant direct category of CN. Well, this is kind of direct category. Here and shoes. On Y, this is sort of the same thing, only of equivariant coherent shoes. And the statement of the theorem is that this is a equivalent. The it's genealized. Sorry? It means that uh, everything is genealized. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so, so, so in here we take, we, we, it's equivalent, we take shifts with g-action on them. Yeah. So, so the statement of the theorem that this is equivalent of equivalence of categories. And in fact, sort of, it's projection to k-theories, because there is a sort of canonical projection from derived category down to k-theory, which is just sort of take a complex and take alternating sum of its elements. So it's projection to k-theory, k-theory is sort of, well, up to swapping the direction around precisely G S P D isomorphism. So it really genuinely leads that result and contains that result. Now, as a little sort of side feature of this business is that from this equivalence, it follows immediately that Y G help of CN is a Kraken resolution. C over G or N to three and in some cases very rare ones in high dimensions. Right. So for which for, N for N two or three. But for high N it's not for high N uh, it's not it's only true if your resolution is uh, well sort of small. The, 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 the dimension of fibers, uh, and fibers not allowed to be divisive. I mean, I will ca come to giving straight kind of exact condition on this. So this sort of this actually was not known before then. So one of the beauties of this result is established that every threefold quotient singularity has uh, a resolution. Then there is a sort of story by Crow and Ishii, which say that you can generalize G clusters to G constellations, which are certain stable quiver representations, and in fact, for every family of stable quiver representations, you get a Krapant resolution, and you can get every projective Krapant resolution this way. So there's a nice story there, but which suggests that we're it's there. Oh, okay. excellent. So which suggests that uh, this, is, this story is not sort of somehow unique to G-Hill, but should really happen for every Krapant resolution. And there is a bunch of papers, some of them by me, which take this direct category correspondence and then extract the geometry out of it. Because you could say, where do uh, structure shift of zero twisted by, 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 by a representation of G goes now in Y? The answer is sort of nice, and it's governed by piece of toric combinatorics Miles came up with about 10 years ago. And that's also sort of another exciting story to tell. But the problem in the Sir? Yeah. You're talking about the toric case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this, this, this sort of known uh, and computed in toric case. Right. So this, this was story so far. So sort of what now? What happens in dim one or greater? So, well, the first thing that happens there is graphing resolutions. Rarely exist. I mean, in threefold, every quotient similarity has a curved resolution. In fourfold, well, good luck. Uh, and in particular, G Hill CN is a rarely crepant and rarely smooth. So in dimension four, this. There will be some results in this direction soon by sort of brief journeys in progress. So very soon we'll have a really kind of a bunch of explicit examples of cases when... Uh, can you maybe separate the two properties? 
Oh. When, when is smooth and when it's... Oh, well, the story is that uh, G, uh, the, there are examples when G-Hill is not smooth. Yeah, for then which the, n is it smooth? Uh, no, no, uh, just I'm talking of, about even in dimension 4. We already have examples of g hill not being smooth. And mm -hmm. g hill being smooth by, by, but not being cracked. And g hill being neither. So, mm -hmm. so this nice part of story completely breaks down. <laughs> so uh, the work in progress I'm, I'm saying is sort of uh, settles the story for a certain subclass of SL4C, providing us with nice examples of more or less each of these configurations which can be computed and studied. And he says it's really smooth. It is often completely pathological. It is often very, very bad in mm -hmm. Do you still have a modular interpretation of the yeah, yeah, yeah. Modular interpretation is completely general. I mean, it's a sort of quiver representation works in any dimension. You get a fine moduli space. Uh, it's just not very nice. That's why I just want to talk. So, but you know, uh, still, we can ask for the following. So, so conjecture one. This is sort of derived Mackay correspondence in its general form. And this says that uh, let G be any subgroup of S L N C finite. And let Y be a Krapant resolution. CN over G. Then we should have this derived equivalence. So, so. The moral is that the meaning of credit. The present resolution is K trivial. Uh, G is subgroup of SLNC, so it, it K Y trivial. Uh, well, the people in the audience have more Ah, uh, yeah, the, yeah, the Krapant resolution is sort of means that is a Krapant resolution if the pullback of canonical class of X is the canonical class of Y. In our case, our X is uh, K trivial, so Krapant in this context means that Y stays sort of the, this has the trivial canonical class. We haven't added. Any non system. So, in some sense, the, this says that on the level of direct categories, your graph resolution really is minimal. There is this sort of equivalent okay. direct category of the original orbit, orbit and that should be contained in every graph resolution. Can I ask a yes. question? The statement that this isomorphism of the right categories implies that you have a graph resolution is true in general? In general, completely in general. In this general, is, so it's yeah. a necessary condition. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so the moment, I mean, the moment you have this resolution, this follows by a sort of nice derived category. I mean, I mean, I could really justify it very quickly, but okay, you know, just or not. let's sort of do that. So now, from here, I would like to talk about two approaches to uh, sort of doing something in dimension four with this conjecture and, and, and sort of higher dimensions. And morally, I should tell you about them in one order. But then I will be. I'll get to five minutes to the end of the talk, and uh, just this, uh, and that will leave me no time to tell you about really cool second story. So let me tell the second story first. So the running a bit ahead, the first story we shall tell second is how to try to take to do to do BKR, so to do exactly what BKR does, only to do it in higher dimensions. What sort of uh, there is a well-known mantra that BKR just completely doesn't work in the dimension, kind of in dimensions uh, uh, for general resolutions in dimensions four and higher. That's not quite true. You can make it work, and in dimension four, it doesn't come at too much of a price. But let me tell you sort of the second story, which is so conjecture one. Try to I want will follow if I have time. And that's doing BKR backwards. So sort of going going back to original Gonzalez primitive in their direction, going from CM to Y. In fact, in fact, conjecture one 
is follows immediately from conjecture two. Conjecture two is let G S L M C finite let Y be any resolution of C and over G. Then there exists a basically an, admi an admissible fully faithful embedding of the equivalent direct category of C and over G into the indirect category of Y. <coughs> Fully faithful. Admissible. Now, admissible simply means it has an arduate. If your functor is given by a Mukai transform, it automatically has an arduate. Mm -hmm. so, then, so this is not really sort of important. This is. And this is sort of part of the same philosophy, that not only crap and resolutions should be your original orbifold, the minimal ones. But any resolution should contain the orbifold. Okay? If you cannot get away from the orbifold, you, you've resolved. Now, this is sort of, it's good to see how does conjecture 2 immediately sort of implies conjecture 1. Oh, yeah, and this has been settled. Conjecture 2, Kawamata uh, in 0, 6 for all abelian G. So this is not just sort of us being uh, hopeful. You know, this is uh, just sort of every result in this field has been proved for abelian groups first, and then it turned out that it generalized to all abelian groups too. So there should be some reason why Kalamata's sort of stuck to magic works. Um, anyways, so let's uh, let me show you how conjecture two implies conjecture one. It's actually sort of few lines. DG of uh, oh, look, 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 look. Thank you very much for this. Yeah. I've been very uh, mental blink. So, conjecture two implies conjecture one. So, right. So, the fact that theta is admissible, the fact that it has an adjoint uh, and fully faithful. implies that derived category D of Y admits a semi-orthogonal decomposition into the guy that's fully faithfully embedded in it. And K, where, let me explain, this K is kernel of the adjoint. So basically, uh, this is, if you have any fully faithful embedding which has an adjoint, you have the same after open composition. That means that every object in here breaks up into direct sum of uh, something in here and here, and there is no uh, homes in one direction. So if there are no homes in direct sum, sorry? exact right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. And if there are no homes both ways, then it's a fully full decomposition, not just semi or fully orthogonal. And you just have this direct category being the sum of two different direct categories. Now, if y is greater than, as Miles had me point out before, canonical class of y is trivial. This means that dy is a color B, what's, called, what's known as color BL category. Color BL category. It has a trivial ser functor. If ser functor is trivial, then any fully orthogonal decomposition, any same orthogonal decomposition has to be fully orthogonal. The uh, color BL Categories do not decompose into the same orthogonal decomposition. So this means that this actually has to be DGCN plus K. But Y is smooth. This means that the right category of a smooth variety is indecomposable. That means Y is zero. Uh, or KK, sorry, sorry, K. For the same reason, 
the, the, all the hard work in Bridge on King and Reed went into showing that your Fourier Fourier transform is fully faithful. The moment it's fully faithful, you, you play the same game with DG of CN. Only you know that CN is smooth and K-trivial. And therefore, any fully faithful embedding into it with, a, with an argument has to be an, an equivalence. Right. So this is all very good. But how, how do we even, I mean, this looks monstrously general. How do we even sort of try to tackle it? Let's. So it is also true that every, most of the results known on this subject for Kraken resolutions were first proved for, Sorry, for G Hill. This C is just given by the Hilbert scheme? Uh, no, no. Uh, no. The, the conjecture is stated for every Kraken resolution, uh, or, or in fact for every resolution conjecture. Okay. In fact, the problem is that if you give me anything even vaguely resembling uh, the right object on diagonal, I guarantee that the same uh, method which I'll show you now will prove that uh, the, con the conjecture is true. So as you sort of, for G-Hilp scheme, we always have this candidate, the universal family on the diagonal. Yeah. Therefore, what I'm going to try to do now is to say, well, let's take G-Hilp and let's try to prove conjecture two for G-Hilp first. So conjecture two for G-Hilp CN. This is sort of work in progress. Progress with miles. So now the reason is that, as, as mentioned already, we have this Z in Y cross C N being universal family, and we suspect that psi Z from D G C N to dy is our guy, is fully faithful. Now, as sort of, in my case, a nice book called Categories for Working Mathematician will tell you that if you want, if you want to try to prove that the functor is fully faithful, the best thing to do is to take its composition with an appropriate adjoint and show that it's an identity. And that's sort of why I did this a co-author with Zarina Anna from University of Chicago, a whole lot of work about a year ago on taking any Fourier Mukai transform and writing its adjunction morphism on the level of kernels. This was kind of an, this was used uh, partially by many people without ever proving it, but we sort of hammered it in in full generality, which means that so there's this little result which for any x and y um, separated schemes of finite type over a field, algebraically closed, characteristic zero, or over complex numbers. <laughs> and if we have any object in the direct category of the diagonal, and we ask for this to be perfect, so perfect object, if y and x are smooth, then don't worry, every object is perfect. If uh, y and x are not smooth, if your object has a finite resolution by locally free sheaves, uh, you're, you're, it's perfect. So basically, all the objects you've ever seen in this talk sort of have nice resolution by locally free sheaves, because they're families of finite length sheaves and so on. So then, the result says that the composition of for a transform, let me write it out first. For a transform with E, which goes uh, from X to Y. So, so correspondence defined by E from DX to D DY. And then composition with left adjoint that goes from Y to X. Therefore, the composition goes from X back to X, and there is an adjunction co unit which goes into identity of X. And this adjunction for you is isomorphic to functor functor morphism induced 
by following composition, by following morphism of objects of derived category of X cross X. So we have here two uh, functors of, uh, which go from X back to X itself. One of them is definitely. Surely, uh, I mean, could you respect and stuff? Uh, surely you should. Uh, you should, one of those A should be E dual. Um, no. I'm, uh, no, 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 no. I'm saying uh, take a uh, thing defined by E and take its left adjoint. This is, oh, of I'm course, sorry, sorry, you know, sorry. I could have written, yeah. I'm sorry. So uh, this well, is definitely. What the adjoint is. Yeah. This is definitely represented by an object. The, 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 the identity is just represented by the structure of the diagonal. If, if so, it's yeah. just two points. Yeah. You're taking a vector space to find out the product of these two points. Yes. Yeah. And you're 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 doing. Yeah. Yeah. I will. Uh, yeah, I, will I, I will write out exactly that. Yeah. So so in fact, kind of, uh, I will. I tried quite hard to find a nice way of explaining what this morphism is without defining about ten different maps, and then kind of have the kind of commutative diagrams here that. Give me nightmares, let alone anybody else. So, let, let I kind of can try to explain this morphism like this. So let us take x cross y cross x. That's sort of that's sort of going to be a natural guy here. Let's take its projection to x cross x. On here, I have the following object, and that's precisely what Miles was talking about just a minute ago. And let me explain what I mean by this. So the little funny square thing simply means I uh, pull, uh, I take sort of external tensor product. So I take E, which lives naturally on x cross y. So E12 means take E on the first two components and pull it up to this triple thing. This means take E dual on this guy and pull it up to a triple thing. And this means takes, take sort of canonical um, well, dualizing complex on y and pull it up to this guy. I mean, if y is smooth, this is just a canonical shift shifted by n. But we are doing it in gratuitous generality, so th this could be a nasty complex. So the, the morphism which we are getting at is sort of obtained in three steps. First step says, we take this pretty picture and restrict it to diagonal. So restriction to diagonal x cross y in x cross y cross x, and x in this guy. So once we do this, there is no difference between e12 and e23 once you restricted this to the diagonal. So you obtain simply x cross y, on which you have e tensor, e dual tensor, the pull up of canonical shift of y, and then now, let me explain what, what goes on here. So the morphism which defines the, this guy, the object, is actually this big guy up here pushed down to x cross x. So first thing, after we've taken this restriction map. So, we, so it, might, it should be the diagonal of in x times x times y. Uh, well, I, what, all I mean is if you have a, b here, you put it in a, b, a. So I sort of take okay, y. So the last is an x. Okay. The last, the last oh, is an x. Is, yes. Okay. Sorry. It's so uh, the calligraphy. yeah. You see, in the end, I should have, I should always have an object on x cross x. So so instead of taking this guy and pushing it down here, I'm saying take a restriction of this whole picture to diagonal, and now we have this guy on x cross y. Push it down to x and put it diagonally into x cross x. Mm -hmm. So first thing is restriction to diagonal. Second thing is now evaluation map. I mean, one of the uh, sort of part of derived category magic is that you can treat everything uh, like if it was a vector bond. If you have an object times its dual, it has a unique map into the just the structure shift. So this just goes into x cross y, canonical shift of y, down to x. And, well, this is called trace map. Amorphism, and kind of, let me be precise in a way. You have this guy, when you push it down, you obtain a, you, 
right. What I write here describes what happens in every fiber. So we just have we just have in every fiber here over every point of x we have a canonical shape of y. So what we do is we take the uh, global push uh, is we take the push down we take um, derived glo derived global section thing, and then we have a map into into one copy of C, and we. Basically, we have a map from a complex whose cohomologies are just sheaf cohomologies of a canonical bundle of Y into one copy of C. This is precisely dual to the map from C to cohomologies to the complex whose cohomologies are just the sheaf cohomologies of um, Y. So basically, uh, the whole point of this is to say that this map will, and then and then you just obtain O of X sitting on X in that and into this guy. So it should be H n of omega to what to H naught of O. Uh, yeah, well, um, H yeah, yeah, ah, H dot. 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 So it's a, okay, yeah, it's a complex whose it's just a yeah, problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's no problem. So the idea is that the moment you have the, the moment the structure shift of your the moment the cohomologies of your Y are kind of the moment it has any shift cohomology, this is not going to be an isomorphism. You know, you will start getting kind of uh, some junk already here. And our goal, what we need to show is that these guys, uh, this morph, this chain of three morphisms is an isomorphism. So, I mean, I wrote it out here to show that this guy is never an isomorphism, and these two will never be an isomorphism either. This is sort of a bit gratuitous. But our object E is not just sort of any old object. It's a structure shift of this universal subscheme inside y cross cn. So then let me, let me now draw the same picture, but more concretely in our case. So what we have is, imagine now we have, we have a following sort of square. I mean, E has a locally free G equivalent solution. Yeah. Yeah, uh, because it's a, it's a moduli space of finite length shifts on CN. Any moduli space of finite length shifts on CN has a kind of has a um, has a uh, resolution by locally free equivalent shifts. That's that's a result. So now, I mean, when I say Z to three, I just mean Z cross CN, where you take Z and embed it into CN cross Y and just map a map it trivially here. Similarly for Z one two inside here. So this is exactly the, these two guys. And uh, here I have just their intersection inside this guy, so, which I will denote by Z dash. So we have this picture. And on here we have this, well, uh, instead of being omega y, it's now omega of z over, I mean, this, this universal family has a projection to uh, Cn, of course. And we have the, the relative dualizing shift. And over here, we just have O of Z12. And then we have a projection to CM cross CM. So this guy here is just take, take this guy, the relative dualizing shift, push it in here. Take this guy, push it in here. Take tensor, uh, derive tensor product and push it down to CM cross CM. The, now, I'm sort of drawing this to show exactly kind of how wrong things will go here. Because first thing we do is we restrict this whole picture to diagonal. And that's sort of in itself a very lossy procedure. And then we'll get Z, Z. So actually, this picture, when restricted to diagonal, immediately becomes very nice. These are yotas, these are identity maps, because kind of when you when you restrict the diagonal, there's no difference between these two. This is precisely this picture. And we take, once again, the relative dualizing shift here, just OZ here, and then we project down to CN and insert that. So now, the evaluation map becomes something known as Kudeth map, which is just really intersection. Kind of, it's a derived intersection. Instead of taking these two guys, pushing them in here and taking a direct tensor product, I can take their pullbacks to Z and then take this sort of diagonal embedding here, which is also the This is sort of uh, 
and there is a theorem which says that this that this procedure there is a there is always a canonical morphism from taking two objects here, taking the inserting them in, in this guy and taking it as a product, or pulling pulling them back and inserting them in this way. There is always a canonical morphism, and it's isomorphism precisely when uh, your kind of, this square is what's called tor independent when this guy and this guy are tor independent over this which is certainly not going to be the truth if you're taking the same sub-variety. You're taking derived self-intersection. It has huge cone. So sort of derived self and self-intersection of Z with itself. <coughs> hugely, hugely lossy procedure, but at the end of it, you just get this relative dualizing shift, because when you pull these two guys here, you just get these guys sitting in here, and then you insert it into here. And then, uh, which you insert into Y cross CM, and then project to CM, and then uh, down to CM or CM. And now, once again, you have, uh, you have a trace map. You're going from Z to CM, and you're, and you're pushing down precisely the relative dualizing shift of this map. So the trace map gives you, gives you once again, all the diagonal in CM or CM. So now the main feature, and the whole reason to bother with derived categories here, is that there is it's sort, of, it's sort of an amazing result. The QNet map, as mentioned, is sort of only, only an isomorphism when your, your square is tor independent, which means that one of the maps is flat, or you have two sub varieties intersected transversally, or sort of life is nice. But so again, result. I will not sort of state it precisely, but QNET, but I mean, it has been written down, and there is a precise statement of that. QNET map commutes with arbitrary base change. So let me explain what this means here. This means that instead of restricting to diagonal and then taking the QNET, and then, and then taking this intersection, we can first take this intersection here and then restrict to the other. And you know, this taking the, the self-intersection here is certainly a lossy procedure. Taking an intersection of these two guys is much less lossy. They, it's okay, they don't coincide. So this means that we can rewrite this as. So we start with the same setup. This sort of Z23 and Z12, which is just two copies of Z insert in sort of two different ways into, into this guy. And then we have, but now I consider this sort of the embedding of their intersection. I will call this delta dash. And then we have y of z over cn. And we have all z1, 2. So now I first do the kind of map here. And that means instead of pushing them in and then taking the, uh, the intersection, I first pull them back in here and then take an insertion here. So which is this is derived intersection of Z12 and Z23. And what I obtain now is just that Z dash, which is inserted by Yota dash into CM cross y cross cm, which is then projected to cm cross cm. And then I have this y z over cm sitting here. And now I take restriction to diagonal. So restriction to diagonal turns z dash into just z. Restriction to diagonal turns cm cross cy cross cm into just cm cross cy, turns this yota dash into just yota, and turns this into a projection to cm, and then down to cm cross cm. And then we have w uh, z over cm. So we're in exactly the same story as there, and then there is a trace map. Trace map. We are pushing down the relative dualizing shift, so there's a map from that into O of CN, sitting on CN, and then insert it 
my data going to CM cross CM, which is what we need, the structure of the data. Now, let me denote this morphism of objects. Of, we always, this is all, despite me kind of writing it schematically, this is always, these are three genuine morphisms of objects on, C, on CM cross CM. And let me denote this QNF map by one, the restriction to the diagonal by two, and trace map by three. Well, this is sort of a punchline. So basically, just by some derived category of voodoo, I've conjured up three kind of four objects on CM cross CM and three morphisms. And all I have to do to nail this conjecture is to show these three morphisms to be isomorphisms. Well, the derived QNF map there is always an iso in full generality. This is because why? This is because as Z is flat over Y. Z is the universal uh, is the universal family of guys in CN over Y. That means that Z is flat over Y. Look what happens here. We have two objects which are flat over Y and we're intersecting them over Y. That's as store independent as it gets. So this sort of this thing that and it, let me tell you one story. If you go backwards, if you go from Y to CN cross to Y, then this QNF map will have you proving uh, incredible sort of orthogonality condition on gazillion of these G-clusters, and you have no hope of doing that. Here, it just vanishes. Three, the trace map here, is an iso. Well, in Kraken case, so if we restrict ourselves from conjecture two to conjecture one, then the fact that um, this is by Kawamata Vyuhek, Kawamata Vyuhek, which tells you that all the higher shift cohomology vanishes, plus definition of GHU, which tells you that global sections do as they should. Now, we also believe that this should hold in not just a Krapan case. We just need this. Uh, so the, the, the statement that in, uh, with global sections everything is all right is true completely generally. But we need this sort of uh, higher, high, punishing of higher shift cohomologies, higher direct images. That sort of Kawamata view egg is not good enough uh, for, for us. and doesn't give us a need. Number two, again, by the same sort of magic, reduces to a morphism of torsion-free sheets. So all the higher cohomologies vanish in Kraton case, just like there. And then we just have two torsion-free sheets a morphism between them, and we have to show it to the isomorphism. And, and, and that's what we are trying to nail at the moment. The moment we nail that, so, right. I have four minutes left. So as I, ex as I expected, I will tell the second story first. I have problems. So let me just give a, a quick dry summary of what can you do. I mean, the conjecture one, try one, make the care work in DM4. Now, this is sort of hopeless game. Because if you prove this conjecture, you immediately show that your G-Hill is a crack resolution. We know that's almost never is. In fact, that story tells you that uh, it's really wrong to try to prove your kind of G-Hill, which is often a resolution, but not a crack resolution, to go this way. Because here you are trying to prove this kind of nasty orthogonality result. But if you really work hard and keep kind of nice track of what happens in bridge on King Reed and sort of refine some stuff in there, you'll get a following theorem. Well, I will not state the I will not actually state the theorem itself. I'll state a I'll state a corollary kind of what this theorem does for you in dimension four. So let G be a subgroup of a cell four C finite. Let 
y equals g here. For if for every p q two points on the exceptional set of y general, so by saying general points, I mean a uh, p q lie both lie on at most one one irreducible exceptional divisor. Which means you, you are allowed not to check this for points which lie on the intersection of several divisors. If you are sort of miles and you've done a lot of computations, you know that this, this the orthogonality conditions I'm about to write down now look nastiest at the sort of toric fixed points where you're intersection of as many divisors as possible. That's where it's sort of hardest. Well, here we're saying take the easiest possible points. If you show that gx1 first x in CM between the corresponding G clusters vanishes, then Y, then BKR works. So Y G here of C4 is a parameter solution. And there is a derived equivalence. Conjecture one holds. So uh, this is actually, I mean, you, strictly speaking, you have to do this for GX0, 1, 2, 3, uh, show the simplicity that home zeros vanish, and show that Kadaris tensor matrices are more. So the theorem tells, is, tells you that it's all unnecessary. The only thing you have to do is you have to check x ones, everything else follows automatically. So sort of, we have hope in a nice problem for some graduate student. Uh, I mean, there are some groups G for, for which G hilt is a correct resolution. So one class of G in SL for C, for which this vanishing holds for group theoretic reasons. So I don't believe that this is kind of direction which is worth pursuing in sort of higher dimensions and so on. But it would be nice to have a, some uh, class of subgroups for which, for just pure group theory, this GX will immediately vanish. Because then the whole BKR mechanism kicks in and you obtain this. So that's then the price